you're persistent, you could achieve it. But if you're consistent, you could keep it. There is a glorious world on the other side of no that、doubt. perseverance. Sometimes we're burnt out not because we're doing too much. Sometimes we're burnt out because we're doing too little of the things that make us feel alive. There are challenges. But with challenges comes change. Man, if I could drop this mic, I would. <laughs> but、okay. then the podcast would be over. <laughs> Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Jim Quick, man, what a treat! Welcome to the Commune podcast. So good to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking time. I know you're a busy man. We're here at the、uh, biohacking conference,、mm. hacking our. Respective biologies, yes,、um, and、uh, you know you're sought after human, so I appreciate the time. I'm very excited about this conversation, and thank you everybody who's tuning in. So I can't imagine a better person to talk to about optimizing learning and neuroplasticity in general,、um, because the number one question I get about learning from people in my audience.、Um, Is is it too late、mm. to learn in midlife? And、uh, I always like to ground、uh, or anchor my conversations in a in some specificity. So I'll just give you a two minute version of my attempt to learn in midlife. Okay. And we can you can kind of dissect it.、Mm-hmm. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me how I can optimize it. We can get geeky about certain. Protocols we can do、mm-hmm. around eliciting particular neuro- neurotransmitters that might optimize learning, or certain kinds of habits, etc. So, I woke up on November tenth, twenty sixteen. I would have been forty six.、Um, Donald Trump had just won the election. This is not a political podcast. Don't worry.、Um, and I asked myself the question: What made America great in the first place? So. There's a lot of answers to that question, but what I landed on was the Great American Songbook. Duke Ellington, Billy Strayhorn, Fats Waller—these incredible composers of America's kind of indigenous jazz music—that for a generation or two generations, everybody knew those songs. It really, really brought people together.、Uh, didn't matter, you know. Race, creed, socioeconomic status—like people knew those songs, "Satin Doll" and whatever. So I was like, "Okay, I'm going to learn how to play a standard jazz song. I'm going to learn one every week on the、mm. piano, with no training." But I knew the songs; like they had been in my in my upbringing.、Right. My dad was playing them and stuff. So I sat down at the piano that first week. I was really bad. <laughs> I was <laughs> awful at it, but I knew the songs, and I knew I had some vague notion of how to read music and a general sense of harmony. So I wasn't coming at it from zero, but、uh, I clanked away on the piano, one a week. So first week really hard, second week still really hard, two months still pretty hard, three or four months later. I was picking these songs up a little bit quicker, and five, six months later, I could start to actually read them off the sheet a little bit more. Come a year, you know, I developed a repertoire of fifty-two songs,、mm-hmm. and I could get up at a dinner party and clank them out somewhat nervously as a total amateur, but still really enjoy it and、yeah. have a ton of fun. And that really opened my eyes. To this notion of neuroplasticity, essentially,、yeah. you know, that our brains are not fixed; that in response to our environment, we can create and generate these new neural networks. Man, amazing! <laughs> But I made a lot of mistakes along the way, and I don't think I did it as quickly as I might have, or I don't think I optimized around learning、mm-hmm. as quickly as I might have learned. Now I know that so many people. In my audience and everywhere in the world, they're like forty-five, fifty, fifty-five, and they're like, "Is it too late for me?"、Mm. Um, boy, would I love to learn a language or、yeah. play piano、mm. or pick up a skill that、uh, that I always wanted to. 
So you've done so much incredible messaging uh, around this with Limitless and Quick Brain and all of the mm. celebrities that you've worked with and all the public speaking that you've done. And I'm here to pick your brain yeah, <laughs> on how we can optimize um, that process of learning. Well, first of all, respect. You know, I think uh, no matter our age, it's you never want to get to the point where you just feel like you know what you're going to know for the rest of your life. And uh, it takes energy and it takes effort and focus and commitment to do what you did. And I love when you're describing it because your face was just lit up, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and it comes there. There are challenges, but with challenges comes change, just like getting to the gym for the first time for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. You know, it could be a little bit uncomfortable setting up a new routine and, you know, warming up some muscles that we didn't know that we had. Um, but how fulfilling it is to be able to go through that process, right? I mean, amazingly fulfilling and frustrating. So I want to ask you about <laughs> yeah. how one summons perseverance through mistakes yeah. and how that actually can be a positive um, process. But maybe we'll just start at the beginning. Are there, um, for example, certain mm -hmm. times of day yeah. that are optimal for learning? So I would say no matter your age and stage, and I, I fall in the range of the, the age groups that you're mentioning, for sure. <laughs> this is my 30th year of, of coaching, so people get an idea. I did not start when I was five years old. Um, there are uh, some people, they, they call them chronotypes. We talk about it in mm -hmm. Limitless, that there are certain time types. And there really is a biology to how we express, mostly based on our hormonal expression. Some people really are early birds and some people are more night owls, and they just thrive. They're most creative. They're the most focused at those times. And so when you know your time type, you know where to kind of allocate your resources, your attention, um, take on certain activities. It Once you know the, your chronotype, you might know when the best time is to work out, when's the best time to eat, when's the best time to be able to phase down to go to sleep, uh, to be able to make love, to be able to, to write your book or, or play your music. And so I think self-awareness really is a superpower, for mm. sure. Um, you know, I think we needed a curiosity to get to know ourselves. And then the other half is having the courage to be ourselves yeah. also as well. A lot of people do a lot of introspection. They'll do uh, talk therapy. They'll journal. And they'll get to know who they are, you know, their identity, what they stand for, what's most important to them in life, their values and beliefs, but then also acting on it. You know, so you, that your your character and your integrity, your your behaviors are matched with those things. Um, yeah. So, so for me, I, I am definitely more of an early bird. Mm -hmm. I love. I wrote most of my book more during the early hours when I'm not going to be distracted. I found I was most creative at those times, so I allocated that time because I think I would have given me for two hours. I did it in the morning. I think it would have taken me four hours to do later in the day, and I wouldn't have been as efficient. And you know, especially if I'm doing it consistently. Um, you know, I also work in certain amounts of time. It's kind of interesting. It's not just when you do something, it's how long you do it. Mm. And there's some little bit of debate on this. You know, studies uh, um, show that for anything from the, there's a technique called the Pomodoro technique, yeah. which talks about the human attention span tends to be around 25 to 30 minutes, which is about, about the length of a television sitcom. Yeah. And then after that, I can imagine a lot of listeners or viewers that you relate that you're, you lose energy or you lose focus. And um, so the Pomodoro technique is working within that 25, 30 minutes and then taking maybe a five minute, what I call a brain break, you know, give your brain a little time to, to reset. It's kind of like the rest you take between maybe some reps in, you know, when you're working out. And uh, during that time, I like to do three things to rejuvenate my brain. Uh, one is I like to move. I find that a lot of times when people are learning something, they maybe they're doing it predominantly sitting down or they're behind the screen. And I think as your body moves, your brain grooves. When, yeah. we, use, when we utilize our body, it actually stimulates our mind. We create brain-derived neurotropic factors, um, BDNF, which is like miracle grow or fertilizer for that neuroplasticity that we were talking about to help us create new, new connections. And I find that also what I'll do during that break is when, it's just like when you're working out. If you want to build your physical muscles, you give it novelty and you give it nutrition. And so when you're learning, you're getting novelty. And I also think you have to feed your brain certain nutrients, which we could talk about you know, in this conversation. 
Um, and I'll do that during uh, during the break. I mean, here in the studio, you have some uh, blueberries. I like to call them brain berries. Yeah. You know, you and I are being you know very well hydrated. I can't wait to t- t- try some of your homemade uh, brain snacks, brain healthy snacks. And um, yeah, you, then there's a whole area of science called neuronutrition. That there's certain uh, nutrients that your brain is only two percent of your body mass, but it requires twenty percent of the nutrition, the air, the oxygen. It's really an energy hog. You yeah. know, it takes a lot. It burns a lot of calories. Um, so you want to be able to feed that machine. And so I'll do that during my break. I'll also, um, as I mentioned, hydrate. Your brain is uh, predominantly water, you know, and even a 2% drop in hydration could disrupt our reaction time or thinking speed. Mm. And so I think it's very important to be able to hydrate. Um, and then finally, what I'll do besides moving and hydrating and getting some nutrition is um, I, will, I will breathe. And it's interesting because sometimes... I find that when people are studying, sometimes they'll have a natural tendency to to hold their breath or to do very shallow breathing. And I find that sometimes if you have fatigue, brain fog, um, it comes from not having enough oxygen. A lot of times when people are even reading and studying new material, and they, their posture, their, it's collapsed, mm. and their diaphragm is shut down, where the lower one-third of our lungs absorbs approximately two-thirds of the oxygen. So a lot of times you're not so much uh, you know, bored with what you're reading. You just don't have the energy to get through it because you're not, um, you're not getting enough oxygen. So maybe I'll go outside, get some sunlight, do some maybe some box breathing to kind of revigorate, kind of clear some, some, some mental fog, and then, uh, and then come back and, and resume. Yeah. Well, you mentioned breath work. So it's really interesting because the breath is this kind of avenue that we can consciously leverage into our subconscious, into the Mm -hmm. autonomic nervous system, um, such that we can influence our sympathetic or parasympathetic state, Mm -hmm. depending on kind of what we need at that time. And learning is so interesting because we need alertness, so mm-hmm. and we need to be energized, but we don't want to be too alert, too energized that we can't focus. For those of just listening, <laughs> Jim's wearing a shirt that says "focus." <laughs> um, so it's this really interesting balance of alertness and focus, yeah. and uh, and those are obviously concomitant with various neurotransmitters like epinephrine or adrenaline, which you know you can stimulate through certain kinds of breath work, more like a Wim Hof breath or mm-hmm. something like that. But then if you need focus, maybe you wanna do more of like a box breath or more, uh, or a Andrew Weil has the, I think it's like four, seven, eight or something it like is, that. four, seven, eight. Um, where you're moving more in your to your parasympathetic, you're more stimulating acetylcholine or these kind of uh, neurotransmitters that help focus. So there's this really beautiful, interesting balance. And when you understand the mechanisms of your physiology, you can begin to like leverage these different breath techniques. It's really cool. Very much so. And I, I love that the way you put it because it's almost like a like a harmony or you're, you're, it's almost a, a, a biochemical symphony. Yeah. And you, so there's a, there's a science to it, but there's definitely an art to it also as well. That's very personal for each individual and you know, how we get there is different for, for each of us. Um, and you're right. The certain breathing, sometimes I'll even play around and do some, some nasal breathing, you know, with your, your thumb and your, your ring finger and I'll breathe in through one nostril and out and then I'll switch. Um, and so it's really, there's an art to it. You know, you know, sometimes learning just like life is a little bit messy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not the kind of person who wants to monitor every, you know, while I do have certain wearables and, you know, certain metrics that I keep track of, you know, I don't want to be doing it, you know, moment to moment. But I, it, it's, it's so wonderful that when we could fall in love with our own nervous system, when we could fall in love with, I usually am always seen pointing to my brain or wearing shirts with the brain on it just to remind people that, you know, what you see, you take care of. You see your hair, you see your clothing, you see your car, your skin. But we don't see the thing, you know, that takes care of us, that in the, kind of this master control center. And so, you know, my message for everybody is really to, you know, get to know your brain. You know, it, it'll improve your self-esteem overnight because it's so magnificent, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, so you know your brain, you get to trust your brain, you get to love your brain, and, and mostly you get to use your brain. 
you know, using it to do magical things like to be able to learn. I mean, that's really our superpower, our ability to adapt, to, to add new knowledge, skills, and abilities. You know, everybody has a to-do list. I'm very big encourager of some, you know, people starting a to-learn list, you know, because, you know, there, there's this time and, you know, where we could novelty. I know when people say that they're just Somebody told me outside, and they're, they're like, they're just uh, at this event, they're bored. I'm like, how can you be bored? Like, there's so much <laughs> to be interested in, even outside of this event, just to kind of, uh, you know, stimulate us. Yeah. So, most people are familiar with circadian cycles, um, which is <laughs> 24 means, hours. Yeah, it means about a day, I think, literally. <laughs> um, and that uh, I've mostly heard chronotype. You brought up chronotype. Um, I mostly associate that anyways with sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a friend, um, Michael Bruce, who talks mm -hmm. about chronotypes and he has his chronotype test, et cetera. Um, but inside uh, circadian rhythms, there are these smaller uh, cycles called ultradian rhythms. 90 minute cycle. Yeah, exactly. Do you find that interval or duration of time to be a to be a pretty good duration for a learning session. It does work for me. I find that that our focus and our ability to keep our attention can be can grow and expand with practice. And one of the benefits of doing mindfulness training or some form of meditation. Um, I like to bring mindfulness into everything that I do because I feel like that's a practice that is not reserved just for you know certain activities. We could bring it into uh, you know when we're communicating with someone at this moment, when we're reading, mm -hmm. you know, when we're eating. So many people are, it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat and also how you eat. Yeah. Some people are, they're watching, net, you know, they're doing other <laughs> things. And if this is your time where you're supposed to rest and digest, but you're watching, you know, this crazy drama, whatever kind of play out or on your on social media, I, I feel like we're not even tasting our food. Well, yeah, <laughs> or properly absorbing it. So I have three yeah. teenage daughters um, God help me, <laughs> Jim. I need some counsel, man. <laughs> oh my I need a cabin too. Um, actually, I did build a cabin uh, for that express purpose. But um, that's another story. We'll talk about that. Um, but you know, sometimes I see them eating while they're staring at their phone. Mm. And of course, we have a practice when we gather as a family, which is our kind of strange form of grace. Uh, we have a, a ritual, it's called Rosebud Thorn, so we go around the table before we eat and we all share what our rose, our bud, and our thorn of the day or of the week was. And it's a really wonderful way for me to reconnect with my kids and my wife and to share, and oftentimes it's very vulnerable and, you know, but really what it is, is we move from any sympathetic state that we might be in to a parasympathetic state where our blood isn't pulsing out to our extremities, but it's actually focused in around the gut and around digestion. So when we actually consume the food, there's the energy to properly absorb that food in our small intestine. And I think about, you know, there's this old adage, you are what you eat. But really, it's like you are what, what you, you can absorb, absorb right? I, no, I have to ask this because I know some listeners that are like me. I need, I need to know more about Rosebud Thorn. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's just a sweet ritual where uh, I might say, Jim, you know, share with me your Rosebud Thorn of today. And your rose represents kind of the most exciting, positive thing that you experienced across the day. Your thorn is obviously like the most negative thing, the most pointy or sharp thing. And the bud is, it's a little bit um, liminal. It could be something that has potential, but hasn't come into fruition yet. Oh, I like that. Yeah, which is actually the uh, generally the most exciting it hovers around the bud. Mm -hmm. Um, cause the bud is the most exciting. It's like, you've started businesses. I've started businesses. The most exciting part of it is when it's just yeah. budding, right? <laughs> so maybe we'll play. Do you want to play for a sec? Do you have a rose of the day? Yeah, I, I, I could definitely do this. Um, <laughs> it's a little off topic, but yeah. well. <laughs> I, so a rose for me was I, I got to see somebody who I haven't seen for 
quite a many years mm -hmm. and it happened through serendipity it was more of a synchronous event it wasn't planned but uh, we happened to connect here at the hotel and bump into each other and it was just it was just a real highlight it was a real rose moment mm -hmm. uh, a thorn for me I, I woke up to find out that uh, you know somebody that I know is a little bit uh, sick and uh, they uh, you know, they had a stroke and uh, that was news that came uh, just recent so that was like that that hit here um, bud I, I, every day there's, there's, there's so many buds I, 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 I when you were describing you know new businesses and new ideas and the opportunities it's something that it's it you know that startup kind of phase when things are starting to show um, I have an idea for a book that I'm very excited about mm. Mm. and I, I have three books coming over the next three years so I'm, I'm excited there but a new concept that uh, being in this environment sparked and um, I was meditating on it this morning and I was journaling about it and I'm excited. I think this is going to, this is something that could really uh, take, take a uh, seed and, and, and grow into something. That's a perfect bud. Yeah. It could flower, it could blossom, Yeah, but it's still in its potential form. Yeah. How about, <laughs> how about you? Oh man. Well, my, my rose is really just being here and in community and really mm. just connecting with people. Yeah. I mean, I love this, to be honest, yeah. because I am right here, right now, all there. I am not... I feel it. I am not in the least bit distracted. And uh, we'll maybe probe distraction at some mm -hmm. point because we live in this attention economy and that's vying for our focus at every possible minute. And there's 50,000 devices pinging and dinging vying for that particular focus. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is one of the reasons why I love to do what I do mm -hmm. because it's, it's a form of mindfulness, really. It's non-judgmental, sacred presence. Boom, yeah. I'm right here with Jim right now. And it might be the only time in, over the course of the day or I am this present. I love it. And I can feel it too. The people, <laughs> the people you you're with, you know, if you're a parent, your children feel it, you know, if you're, if you're in teams, your team feels that presence, you know, and then that's really a gift. Okay. So that's, that's amazing. So that, okay, that's, that's Rose. Rose. Um, my thorn is I'm really struggling with sleep just really over the last few days. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've got a, uh, I'm looking for, it's actually combined with the bud. I'm struggling with sleep because I am looking forward to a few things that are happening, but they're making me anxious. Mm -hmm. So uh, our friend, I'm sure you know him, Gabor Mate, is staying at my house for the next three or four days, and we're doing a lot of media together, and I'm convening groups and things like that, and there's a lot, yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm, holding, I'm holding a lot. And then I'm interviewing Andrew Humerman right on the backside of that. And then Marianne Williamson's coming to stay with me right on the backside. And I, I don't, this is not a name dropping routine. It's just all happened mm -hmm. to stack right on top of each other. And I'm, I just feel like I'm holding a, yeah. a lot and I'm trying to calm down and just be present, but. For sleep. Yeah. So, and you know, man. It's like when you don't sleep, you're not optimal. Yeah, if we're know? talking about brain health and performance, I mean, sleep has to be on top, you know, because when I think your listeners, your viewers know what it's like when they get a bad night's sleep, they can't focus and concentrate. You know, the, our, our temperament has changed, how we relate to people, how we relate to situations and problems, you know, our ability to be creative and have some mental energy and you know, remember things. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe you could talk about that around sleep and the consolidation mm -hmm. of learning. Um, and, and it might not just be sleep. It'll also maybe be like deep rest. Absolutely. It could be, it could be uh, non-sleep deep rest. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it would be one of those things where when we, when we do rest and we, we slow down and we get speed up in other ways because our, our brain doesn't shut off when we, when we sleep, it actually is doing certain activities. It's, um, act, in some ways it's actually more active. Um, it's hmm. potentially has the ability to clear out, uh, uh, plaque, um, when you're sleeping, the sewage system kind of kicks in. 
um, it has the ability to obviously re repair and restore that deep sleep is kind of like reparative to the body and REM sleep is, is a little bit more reparative to the mind. Um, but you also consolidate short to long-term memory during yeah. this time. And so if people are suffering from long-term memory issues or they can't retain information for longer periods of time, maybe look into sleep. I, you know, I highly recommend if people don't feel, and you don't have to, nobody, I don't know many people wake up totally energized and jumping out of bed. Um, but if you feel like you're, your sleep is not where it should be. I, I do recommend a sleep test. It changed my life. Mm. I don't share this very open uh, a lot, but I I had some very severe sleep challenges for about five years. I slept 90 minutes a night, 90, nine zero, very interrupted, not even one stretch of time. For how long? For five years, from like uh, 2008, 2009, for about five years. Wow. Um, it, was, it was tough. I, I got... Um, Diagnosed with severe sleep apnea, so I would stop breathing about 230, 240 times a night. Each time is an episode of at least 10 seconds, so I would stop breathing. So I would wake up suffocating, right, if anyone knows anybody who has sleep apnea. And it's usually uh, presenting issues as, as for uh, if you're overweight, maybe you have more um, around the neck area, and it's, it's obstructing your airflow. But um, it wasn't my issue. It's more genetic. I found out after I was tested with the help of Dr. Michael Bruce, um, tested my parents, tested my siblings. We all have sleep apnea. I'm the most severe in the family. Um, I would wake up a good 12 to 14 times a night and full wake ups, not even just, you know, dust on your aura ring or something. I would be up. Um, I try CPAPs, dental devices, um, have had all kinds of procedures. Um, with, with the help of um, Michael Bruce, uh, we found a doctor at UCLA had a throat there, and they did a U triple P surgery, sur surgical procedure, where they removed my uvula, soft palate, tonsils, which is very tom having your tonsils out when you're a kid is one thing, but as an adult, it, it was very very painful. Um, and my sleep improved. It improved, uh, went up from 90 minutes to about four hours, four and a half hours, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's dramatic going from 90 minutes. Um, and then from there, you know, once I addressed the presenting challenge, I mean, part of it also was I grew up with a traumatic brain injury. I've had actually three of them as a child. I had learning difficulties, so I would have to work harder than all the other kids. So very early on, I developed habits of uh, going to bed late or pulling all-nighters just to keep up with everybody else. Um, I started my career at age 18, so I was traveling a lot after I learned all these skills and methodologies. I could be on three continents in one week. So then uh, as an adult, I spend my life 240 days out of the year on the road, uh, jet lag, uh, time zones, sleeping in foreign environments, right, in the hotels, and I'm not, you know, I'm not on my, my sleep sanctuary or my rituals. So that compounded in these issues, um, that I just eventually was able to recover. And my sleep is not perfect by any stretch, um, but I know what it feels like. And, and I, I would offer this to the listeners. You know, my, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning. And because of it, I was very shy and I never knew the answers. It took me three years longer to learn how to read. Um, I was teased a lot, you know, called the boy with the broken brain. I was labeled. Um, kind of traumatic to even talk about this. Like, I get a little emotional about it. But, um, and I never had the answer. So my, my superpower growing up was shrinking down, was being invisible. Like I, I would sit behind the tall kids because I never knew the answer. Um, and I, that's where I had this kind of almost stage fright, you know, and everyone has a little bit of a fear of public speaking, but mine was a, like a massive phobia where if I was asked to speak in front, I would, my heart would be beating out of my chest. I couldn't breathe. I mean, I would have like a phobic response. Mm. Um, so I didn't want to be seen or heard. Or maybe I did deep down, right? But, you know, as that child, I, I didn't. Yeah, you had a defense mechanism yeah. on it. And right. it's kind of interesting, right? My two biggest challenges were learning and public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and what do I do? You check the box on a couple of those. <laughs> right. And so all I do each day is I public speak on this thing, you know, called learning. And, um, but going back to what I do believe is in every disadvantage, there is an advantage, right? Mm -hmm. That through struggles, we, we gain strength. And so I think there's a gift in that, right? There, I, certainly gifts have come out of my struggles. Um, and for my sleep, you know, that was going on for my whole, most of my adult life, where as a kid, I was having my learning challenges, my adult life, I was having all these sleep challenges. 
And I was saying, where, where's the gift in this, right? You know, I'm like, this is really aggravating because, you know, just going a week without a good sleep really could affect people, right? That's how they torture people. They keep them awake. Oh. But I, yeah. yeah, I mean, even a night, you measure like insulin sensitivity, oh, yeah. or Im- immune system functionality. I mean, I think even with uh, vaccine efficacy, if I, I saw a study mm-hmm. um, around, uh, you know, people that got a good night's sleep versus people that didn't. And vaccine efficacy was directly correlated to, to sleep. And that could be just one night sleep. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, it's the equivalent yeah. of, you know, driving drunk. It's the it's equivalent of, you know, that chronic stress could shrink mm-hmm. your, your brain. And you're not getting the reparative, restorative, um, you know, uh, benefits of, of sleep. And, um, you know, and, it impairs every biological function yeah. with, without a doubt. And so it's one of those things where when we're talking about sleep, it's something that I dedicated a whole chapter of the book there. Um, in in the book because it's it's so important and to prioritize that um, that you know everybody has an alarm clock to maybe wake up most people do but I think it's important to have a, an alarm to go to sleep you know and to stay on a schedule to um, the two two markers for you know as hunter gatherers we would know it's time to sleep because the environment would change specifically there would be a, a dip in temperature a dip in lighting but we don't get that in modern day. You know, right. homes, we can maintain a thermostat uh, temperature. Um, we don't, you know, we could be on our screens or have overhead lights that could, you know, fool our mind into thinking it's still daytime and we're not, you know, uh, producing the melatonin to help us to be able to relax and phase into that kind of uh, kind of sleep mode. And so um, I'm very passionate about this subject, obviously. I found out the yeah. gift out of me. My struggles were two things. Um, number one is it forced me to double down on everything I teach because I, I'm on a mission to be to help people, and I couldn't do and perform what I do um, with doing podcasts and trainings and speakings and books and everything, coaching, um, without doing the things I teach. So I'm very grateful for that. And number two, everything in my life is like heaven yes or heaven no. It's really it's really like I'm here with you, and I could feel you here with me because I don't want to be anywhere else. Like that, that, because I once have said yes to this. Like when I got the invitation to come on your show for this event, I was like, yes. It wasn't even like I had to discuss with my team because I just, if it, if I feel aligned, because when you aren't sleeping, you feel you have a limited amount of time, attention, energy, focus, and you're very selective in terms of what you, what you agree to, Mm -hmm. you know, and my commitments are everything. And so I think a lot of people are burnt out because they're saying yes way too much. Um, And they have a lot of open tabs and they wonder why they're exhausted. You know, they get to the end of the day and maybe they're out with the family at a at a restaurant or looking at a menu and they don't even know what they want to eat because they're just so mentally just depleted. You know, and I feel like it's important to be um, that when you say yes to somebody or something, you're not saying no to yourself. Mm. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Uh, uh, This idea of really fully aligning your works and actions with your highest principles. Mm -hmm. Like you're out there teaching about learning and a significant component of consolidating learning and memory is sleep. But if you are not sleeping, how, you know, there's an imposter syndrome (laughs) out there, you know, so you double down to live in alignment with what you're teaching, to be in integrity, to be authentic. And you know, to be honest, like I struggled with, about with this for a long time. I ran a company called Wanderlust. I founded a company called Wanderlust and ran it for ten years, and uh, it was like a yoga wellness brand. And we did events all over the world. And I would sometimes joke there there was nothing that made me, uh, you know, more stressed out and chubby than running a, a wellness event. <laughs> and I was just burning, you know, yeah. I was just burning hard. Yeah. And, you know, my intention was good. It's like I had this enterprise and it was growing, but I wasn't really truly living in alignment with what I was mm-hmm. representing or what my brand was representing at that juncture. And it took me a long time to realize uh, or to, I said, there's a part of it that's discipline. But there's a part of it that I think is just like a spiritual growth where it's like, no, I these are my values and a life of integrity to me means walking in the footsteps of those values. Mm. 
and <laughs> and you never get there a hundred percent. Yeah. But if you chop wood, carry water every day, yeah. then you are leading by example. You know, and like I said, I'm a dad. They never listen to me, but they never fail to imitate me. <laughs> so I better walk in. in yeah. uh, I better set a good example for them to walk in. I love what you said. You know, certain things are through hard work and grit and hustle. Certain things are attainable, but I don't think they're sustainable over time. Mm. You know, and so if you're persistent, yes, you could achieve it. And you've achieved a lot, a lot with because I was, you know, I was I participated in some of those experiences that you created. And I'm grateful for it. And so it's um, if you're persistent, you could achieve it. But if you're consistent, you could keep it. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> sometimes we're burnt out, not because we're doing too much. Sometimes we're burnt out because we're doing too little of the things that make us feel alive. Mm. Right? And I think I, I saw this quote on integrity that in the spirit of what, what you're saying is, um, and I don't like know who to attribute it to. I just saw it like out and about. It said, integrity is measured by the distance between someone's lips and their life. Integrity is measured by the distance between somebody's lips and their life in terms of their, their talk mm. and their walk, right? Mm. And um, Man, if I could drop this mic, I would, <laughs> but okay. then the podcast would be over. I'll do that. <laughs> um, but but I, 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 lo I love what, what you're saying. And I think for, for me, you know, when you find your, your bliss, you find your passion. Passion for me is what, I, I, when I was writing about it, for me, passion is functionally I found a definition for me is like passion is what lights me up. And there are many things that light me up. So I'm not yeah. limited to having one passion. Purpose, on the other hand, because these words tend to be used interchangeably sometimes, purpose is how I use my passion to light somebody else up. Yeah. So learning is a passion of mine. It wasn't always because I wasn't good at it, um, you know, until about age 18 when I discovered these, these methods and um, this research. But um, learning is my passion, so it lights me up teaching people how to learn is my purpose and that allows me to light other people up that was one of my favorite bits in the book the delineation mm. between those two and the marriage of them yeah yeah they're definitely connected yeah um and uh yeah i mean i think th there is some self-inventory some inquiry involved in passion mm -hmm. and some people just know yeah. you know i'm very jealous of those people mm. that are just Likewise. like you know my daughters, two of them are like dancers. All they want to do is dance. They're dancing six hours a day. It lights them up. And it just lights them up. And man, uh, I don't want to digress too much, but I'll tell you this story. It's very brief. My wife was out of town and I was dadding. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of logistics. I was, my daughter was a dance, my middle daughter, Lolly Undine. And, um, I came to pick her up, and I was a little bit late, to be candid. All the other dutiful moms and dads were there on time. But my daughter was there in the studio uh, by herself. And she was dancing um, alone. And, you know, dance, I think one of the, it's a marketing technique of dance studios. They always put a big pl plate glass window, mm. you know, on the outside so you can see in. So she didn't see me, um, and I was kind of rushing to pick her up, and then I just stopped for a moment, and I saw her there, and she was dancing as if she had no audience, and it was a yoking of action and intention that was pure flow. Mm. It was just so beautiful. Um, she was, she was lost, but found, you know? Yeah. And I was lost in her lostness. And um, this yoking of action and intention is, it's really what we seek. And, um, and this is, you know, if you're cultivating that superpower where time, and you find that, that experience where time just flits away. Yeah. Then you know that you're there. <laughs> you it's know? special. It's so special. And to witness it in someone else is 
is almost just as special, yeah. especially as a father. And even witnessing you explaining, like I got, I just took when you were explaining, uh, <laughs> it might have seen me like, and you go like, I got these tru- uh, these uh, goosebumps. I call them truth bumps. <laughs> <laughs> like but it's uh, bumps. it's one of those things where it's just it's so raw and it's so real. Yeah. You know, when you're when your head and your heart and your hands are aligned, and they're, they're expressing themselves, and you're in that state of that, that state of flow, where you lose your sense of self, you lose mm. uh, track of time, and things almost seem like it's effortless. Make, you know, we we we've, we've done. You know, you've. Many, I'm not sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with the, the research done on, on flow states, but it's, it's like you're just in that zone and you're in your element. And it's a, it's a beautiful, very healing place to be. It is incredibly healing in the sense that you are whole when you're yeah. there. Um, and it requires one to... to cordon off to cubbyhole distraction and distraction is I think one of sort of the most invidious kind of pernicious parts of modern culture because it prohibits us from cultivating this long wave kind of thinking that is so central to both creativity but also problem solving to cooperation so how would you yeah. counsel people to deal with distraction? And you mentioned it earlier, especially, you know, as the years go on with technology, there's just seems like there's more rings and pings and dings, app notifications, social media alerts, like and shares and comments and more cat mm-hmm. videos and <laughs> we're just bombarded, you know, and there's so much noise and it's really sometimes hard to distinguish and, and really focus on that signal, the thing that's that's most important. Um well, it's been my experience that the human brain is has been it's more of a deletion device uh, than anything. It's trying to keep a lot of noise and information out um, because if we let everything in, we would be completely overloaded, overwhelmed. And um, what we let in, it's interesting. Are the things that you know? How do how do we determine what to pay attention to put our kind of spotlight on at any given time? Um, I think uh, part of it is engaging that part of our nervous system, that reticular activating system, RAS, as it's often abbreviated, that RAS, where it's, um, it determines what's important, what, what do you allow to filter in. Um, for example, your name. You know, I, I know for a fact that at busy events like this, if you heard you know, your name shouted out or somebody who's listening heard your, you know, the, you heard your respective name you know, out when you're out and about, you would look, you would pause. Because you know you've trained your nervous system to pay attention to certain things, um, also things you have questions about, things that you value. It's one of those things where I remember years and years ago, my sister would send me emails and postcards of a very specific type of dog. It was a pug dog, right? Um, you know, smushy faces, fawn dogs, and and I didn't know. My question was like, why does she keep sending me these these photos, these images? And I realized that. Her, you know, she had a birthday coming up, right? And um, this was quite quite some time ago. Um, and I, you know, so obviously she wanted one of these dogs for for a gift. And funny thing happened, Jeff. I just, I just started seeing these pug dogs everywhere. I would go to the natural market and I would see somebody online holding a pug dog. I um, I'm a runner. You know, I'm jogging around my neighborhood. I saw someone walking six pug dogs, right? And my question for everybody, and I know everyone knows the answer, is did these dogs, the pug dogs, just magically appear, you know, around me? And of course, no, they were always there, but I was deleting them. And I do believe that um, that part of when we're learning something, let's say you want to focus and be present in a conversation or you're reading something. And so many people have the experience, they'll read a page in a book and then forget what they just read. You know, and they go back and reread and they still don't know because they're distracted because they're not really present and mindful. And part of it might be because they're training distraction throughout the day. You know, you know, where whatever you do that with the nervous system, when we're talking about learning fundamentally, whatever we do repeatedly, we're getting better at whatever we're repeating, we're rehearsing even in our minds and our imagination, we're getting better at and we're always doing that. So even when we're, you know, rehearsing the things that we don't want, we're just practicing, you know, maybe the, you know, poor outcomes. And so I want to be, you know, part of it is having the responsibility and the agency to know that, you know, we, you know, we, we, 
our mind has thoughts, right? We can't shut off these thoughts any more than we can stop our heart from beating. That's our, what our mind does. I mean, the reason we meditate, and we've all heard this, and just maybe people need to hear it again, it's it's not so, you know, we control our thoughts so much as we realize that our thoughts aren't controlling us, right? And so when I'm going back to distraction, first of all, I want to build a muscle of focus throughout the day, the muscle of being present in what I'm currently doing. And part of it is working at different logical levels. Part of it is managing the environment, Right, um, because it's a lot easier here that you know there's a sign on the door. Do not maybe it says do not disturb, or we're off in the corner of you know a location. Um, you know our phones are off, and we're managing our environment a little bit. So that certainly helps. Um, you know, part of it is also not just environmental management. Part of it is mind management. Right, it's, part of it is priority management. You know, I always tell people the most important thing is to keep the most important thing, the most important thing. Mm. You know, like so many people want to manage their time. But it's uh, managing really what's, you know, those activities that we're focusing on. Right. And it's so interesting. I, I think I heard um, I heard Matthew Walker uh, talk about this at one point. He's a sleep expert. Mm-hmm. And um, he was talking about people with photographic memories. And um, at first it's like everyone's very envious of that person. They're like, man, I wish I had a photographic memory. It would make it so much easier to take tests or whatever it happens to be. But people with photographic memories, many of them feel that it's a curse because they don't want to remember everything. And the mind is actually an amazing filter because who cares where you parked in the parking structure yesterday? So your mind is good at just like letting go of that if it's functioning optimally. And and like you said, focusing on right. the thing that is most important. Right. And, and that's a really curious and interesting built-in feature in the system. Very much so. And, you know, so your mind has to pay attention to things like, well, like your, like your name, the things also that are to your survival, um, things that could lead to you know, procreation. Our, we're stimulated by, by different things in terms of our attention and also by the, the, the questions that we have. You know, once I started saying why is, are these pugs important and thinking about what kind and where I'm going to get this dog as a gift, surprise gift, I start seeing them everywhere. Well, the answers are usually in our environment. It's just like when you read, most people get to the end and they didn't have any questions, so they don't get any answers. They'll read a chapter in a book and they never prime their mind with questions that they're looking for. Even mm-hmm. if you look at the basic standardized tests when we were taking reading comprehension tests back in school, you know, the questions were always at the end. But even just basic study technique 101 is looking at the questions first and then reading, because then you know, like, oh, I didn't know that's what was important. And same thing when we're reading something. When you're reading, if you have questions, you're reading and you say, oh, there's a pug dog. There's a pug dog. And those pug dogs obviously represent the answers and the comprehension we're looking for. You know, I I have this idea that our technique that I call the, you know, a dominant question where we have anywhere from 50, 60, 70,000 thoughts a day. And a lot of those thoughts come in the form of questions that we're asking ourselves as we think. And but some questions we ask more, you know, more than any other question. And whatever you ask, you're going to start seeing those pug dogs, you know, answers. And so if we're asking, you know, why am I not enough? You know, why can't I ever learn this? Why do I have a horrible memory? You know, like you're not going to get very empowering answers because you start getting those, you know, like, oh, it's because I'm not snurred. And you come up with these scripts and stories that keep us limited as opposed to limit less. As opposed to asking questions like, you know, how can I make the most of this moment? How do I bring more magic into this into this conversation? Um, how would I make this even more memorable and enjoyable? You know, how can I learn this and, and, and you know, this instrument, this this language and enjoy the process? Right? Um, how do I how do I make this better? Um, you know, and those questions will lead to different different answers because we'll take control of our focus. And then there's distractions. Of, obviously, nobody is focused all the time, nor do you want to be focused all the time. Just like I don't want to remember, as you were saying, for the same reason I don't want to remember everything. You know, forgetting is an art too. There are certain things in my life certainly I want to <laughs> be able to, to forget. And there's certain things I, I, you know, I don't want to be focused all the time either because when you when you phase back, right, and you're not myopic, and you're not focused, you're allowed to see, you know, everything in your peripheral vision, and you get to, to relax. You get to realize, hey, I'm, I'm safe. I mean, there are even techniques, you know, moving your, like a, holding this pencil in front of you, mm-hmm. as I'm just illustrating, or, or your finger, and just, just looking forward, but following it with your eyes to left and to the right, and just, or just, or just focusing it in front and just relaxing it and see how much of the field you could take in. And then there, you could, before you do that exercise, you could do an exercise like 
trying to touch your toes and see how far you get. And there'll be a marked difference for most people after they do this exercise of just relax, like looking at the pencil or the finger in front of them and just trying to see off to the left and to the right. Mm. And they're like, oh, and maybe it's because your body feels safe. Like I've taken more of a 180 degree look at the environment. I know there are no saber two tigers coming after me. And then you try to touch your toes and there'll be a marked difference in terms of how much further you could go because you just feel more relaxed. That's and so then you're holding less stress in your body. And so it's amazing this this mind body connection. I, I find it absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's a topic that just keeps giving. In fact, the more light you bring to it, the bigger the darkness oh, gets, goodness. the more you realize you don't know. Um, yeah, I, there's a meditation that I employ from time to time that's sort of a half-lidded meditation. So I close my eyes halfway. Mm. And instead of seeing labeled objects, I just start to see shadow and light. And it, it evokes this kind of dreaminess that is honestly very unfocused in some ways. But then I kind of turn that attention inward and and start to unlabel myself and i find that oftentimes there's a great epiphany or some sort of great wisdom that comes in that liminal space and so it is this um yin yang or this sort of constant balance of a teeter-totter where you know it is periods of intense focus and then there's also periods of just letting go Mm -hmm. and being open and opening up that aperture, you know. Um, I can't let you go without asking you something about food. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm mindful of, of your commitments and your time here. So um, you mentioned like brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a whole new field called epinutrition, which I'm just getting my toe dipped into, which is just fascinating that certain kinds of food um, actually impact our gene expression such that our genes will turn on or turn off and make different kinds of molecules or signaling, signaling, signaling molecules or proteins, et cetera. Uh, and this could be tumor, tumor suppressing genes or BDNF or all this kind of stuff. So I'm super interested in how food interacts with our underlying genetics. And, yeah. and forms and really interacts with our epigenetics is really what's happening. Um, so I'm curious uh, if you have, you know, your top brain foods mm -hmm. and if you've ever touched, yeah. if you've begun to touch <laughs> that whole world of epinutrition yet. Yeah. I mean, this this is fascinating to me and you know, I'm doing my own personal study and, and research you know, for myself and 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 so that I could be able to share those kind of things. Uh, even at this event, I took a you know DNA test and, and mm -hmm. some other things. You know, for for genetic, I, I lost my grandmother when I was going through my learning difficulties at five, six, seven after my brain injury. I lost my grandmother who took care of me to Alzheimer's, and um, you know, so it, we 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 donated most of the proceeds to my book to Alzheimer's research for women, mm. because women are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's than men. It's interesting because most of the research is done on male brains and treatments on male brains. And um, so I'm very passionate about that um, and, you know, the exciting work coming out. You know, I, I heard this metaphor when it comes to Alzheimer's that, you know, genetics is something that our genetics loads the gun, but our, our environment and our lifestyle really is, you know, pulls the trigger. Yeah. Right. And so epigenetics in terms of how our genes express itself based on our environment and our, our personal experience and how we interpret that experience. Food for me is, is, is data, right? Food is, you know, what we are, what we, eat, you know, literally, or what we are, what we absorb. <laughs> I like that. Um, and it's information, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's information that we're taking in. Um, we know that there are certain foods that actually create a, a hormetic response, um, maybe some, uh, some some foods uh, have some natural defense system that actually could make you more an, you know anti fragile. Uh, I think that's a, a term that's being used more, um, kind of like cold therapy and and you know hot you know hot therapy and those are things I definitely indulge in yeah. every single day um, almost uh, because I feel like it, it builds my resilience and I think it's important to get ourselves to do difficult things that if we can't 
if we just do the easy things in life, sometimes life gets hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if right. we do, you know, it's the hard things in life, chop wood, carry water, then, then life gets easier. Um, and so I feel like I want to, I want to be strong in that area and food could do that also. But going back, some of my favorite brain foods that I talk about in our podcast and, or, uh, you know, the book, avocados, the monounsaturated fat. Um, I love blueberries and I'm going to grab some on the handful on the way out. Um, you know, they're full of antioxidants and part of it is just protecting our brains, right? Um, from oxidative stress, uh, broccoli, uh, olive oil. Is, is one of my favorite, you know, to put into salads, uh, balsamic, vinegar, whatever, you know, and just have, a, I like, I don't so much do count calories as I do look, count colors, and that's kind of like more my mind. I think things can be nutritious and also be made delicious. Um, and the easiest way to follow through on something is to make it easy for yourself, even controlling our environment. Like I have a glass of water by my nightstand, you know, so I make sure I stay hydrated first thing in the morning or I keep my phone away from my bed so I don't grab it first thing in the morning so I'm distracted and I, you know, rewire my brain to be reactive and distracted first thing in the morning. I don't want to do that. And, you know, willpower only take you, you know, so far. And I think I just having it in the, in my bathroom just makes it a lot easier you know, and, and more convenient. I think in life you want to make the things that are good for you easier and the things that are not so good for you make it more difficult to do those things, you know, including for your kids. Um, so olive oil is great food. Um, if someone's diet allows it, and I know everyone's bio-individual, you could have a microbiome test done, see food sensitivity, because everyone is um, has a different biology. Um, eggs for some people, is the choline in eggs, this could be um, uh, good for cognitive health. Uh, green leafy vegetables. Remember, um, for people who eat fish, uh, you know, your brain is mostly fat, so you hear about, uh, you know, wild salmon, sardines. Turmeric is one of my fun ones. I like turmeric. Yeah. I add it with some almond milk, maybe a little pepper, maybe a dose of honey, uh, make a little golden golden milk. It's anti-inflammatory. Walnuts, great. Um, That's my secret. Yeah. Superpower or super uh, food is walnuts. I, I my kids tease me because they find little bags of walnuts all really? over the house. <laughs> Do you plant them there? Or? No, they just kind of end up in different okay. places because I have so many different ones. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Walnuts look like brains. You know, they they look do like, look like. You know, brains. I don't know. If there's no science behind it, but it's definitely a good memory aid to remind you that. Uh, you know, hey, the heart looks like, you know, it's four chambers and, you know, it's supposed to be good for the, you know, the, the human heart, but um, more memory aid. Um, dark chocolate in moderation is good for, and generally what's good, dark chocolate, not high sugar or milk chocolate, but uh, dark chocolate, um, which generally is good for our mood, tends to be good for our mind, you know, also as well. And I, I could take a lot of these ingredients and throw it into, you know, a, a pre, like a, a blender or something and make a little smoothie probably not the fish or the, or the eggs, <laughs> but the avocados, certainly the green leafy vegetables, the blueberries, the little dark chocolate or cacao powder. Um, yeah, I just want to make it del- nutritious and delicious. And so, you know, there's certain foods that uh, they're also anti-anxiety. They help reduce stress, um, you know, as opposed to some foods that are on the other side that actually could encourage um, uh, stress and distraction, like high sugar, right, yeah. Proce- processed food. I mean, we all, you know, have had the experience of having junk food and I mean, I don't think there's junk. There's junk and then there's food. It's two different things. But, we, you know, and we're in a food coma and you're not going to study. You're not going to perform your best, you know, on the keyboard or, you know, learn that language, you know, really well. So it's not so much, you know, in, in school I realized with, you know, all the learning challenges I had, it's not, how, it's not how smart you are or how smart your kids are or how smart your team is. It's not how smart you are. It's how are you smart, you know. And they, everyone has a different way of expressing genius, it's not just like in taking the SAT is verbal, linguistic, and mathematical. You know, there's there's this spectrum. Even the work by Doctor um, uh, done, done by uh, at the multiple intelligence theory, theory, Howard Gardner talks about. Hey, what about musical intelligence? What about kinesthetic intelligence? What about the great visual artists? You know, who exhibit great visual spatial intelligence? You know, what about interpersonal intelligence? People are great at connecting right. with individuals. What about intrapersonal intelligence? People are great at connecting with the self. You know, what about the people, uh, the naturalists, the people who exhibit an incredible uh, connection with nature um, and the cosmos? And so there, there's, my, my thing with when it comes to intelligence, it's not something that's fixed. 
you know, and there's not one way of exhibiting intelligence. There's there's a wide variety and buffet of it, and um, and we can grow it. We've discovered more about the human brain, you know, in the past ten years and the previous thousand years combined. You know, and now this information is out there. You mentioned, you know, we were talking about uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, like all this great research coming out about the human nervous system and, and its vast potential. And, and I feel like it's so ex it's, it's such an exciting time. It really is, Jim. You know, I think about the early 20th century with Einstein and Niels Bohr and Max Planck and sort of this um, efflorescence of, of, of knowledge uh, moving from Newtonian physics to quantum physics and relativity theory and all this, essentially telling us, like, the world is not fixed. It's dancing and mm. it's vibrating. And at the most quantum level, energy is just, it, there's construction and destruction. Um, and now we've moved kind of 100 years later, and I think about what this era is. And in, in a way, it's applying some of that same knowledge or those, those same themes, but to human physiology, hmm. that epigenetics, neuroplasticity, the microbiome, all of these emerging fields of study are telling us that we are not fixed. Yeah. And, uh, and it is such a fascinating and interesting time and uh, you know the clinical research is always like having to keep up with you know some of the thought leaders and some of the hypotheses that are getting put out there and you know around longevity and biohacking and all this stuff that that we're into um, and it's really just uh, it's a tremendous uh, amount of fun and yeah. uh, and it and it's very stimulating um, for one's curiosity and if there's anything that I've learned it's been uh, to be comfortable in the discomfort of not understanding something right away. Yeah, please, please. You know? It's not always supposed to be easy. It's just like going to the gym. Sometimes you have to you know, push ourselves. And you know, sometimes when we get to the eighth or ninth or tenth, that very uncomfortable rep is when we get the most benefit. And same thing with learning. Yeah. You know, even the, the the weeks of practice to to get a song right or to get you know, so you're, you know, uh, a language or whatever it happens to be, that's an important part of the process. And as children, we did that more naturally. You know, we did something that's like, if we want to learn how to walk, we would, you, you know, you wouldn't give up after falling three times, yeah. right? You could do it 300 times. And sometimes as adults, we're afraid of looking bad. We're afraid of making mistakes. Um, you want to get a, you know, a magic pill, but there's no magic pill, but there is a process for sure. Yeah, it's that fear of judgment mm -hmm. often that holds us back from making mistakes, yeah. but there is a glorious world on the other side of no that doubt. perseverance. No yeah. doubt. I, I know that life, for a fact, that life is life is hard for one of two reasons. It's either because we're leaving our comfort zone and we're learning and we're growing, or life is hard because we're staying in our comfort zone. Mm. You know, And what if you know our life was exactly the same three, five, ten years from now? I don't think most people would feel you know, as fulfilled as they could. And so there's a quote in my book from a French philosopher and he says, life is the C between B and D. And B stands for birth, D stands for death, life C, choice. That every single day we have a choice uh, in terms of where we're gonna, and we've been out there, we're the sum total of all the choices we made, right? Who are we gonna spend time with? What are we gonna eat that day? Where are we gonna live? Who, you know, all these things. Um, and I would just say that we always wake up every single morning and we have a choice and we have a chance, you know? So I think it's important to choose, 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 choose warmly and choose wisely. Mm. Beautiful. Jim Quick, what a treat. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for this time together. Likewise, but even more grateful for all the inspiration that you've given so many people to be their best self day in and day out and for being so vulnerable about your own story. So no, you're I, the man. I, I, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for everyone who's listening. And, you know, I wish, you know, when you're talking about things being fixed, for me, that's like, hey, you know, the, the idea that things are just limited. And, and they're not, you know, it's this, the sky is not the limit is what we learn. You know, our minds are more the limit, you know, but so many people are shrinking what's possible to fit their minds when we should be maybe expanding our minds to fit all that's possible. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.